about three years ago, when the new decade rolled around 2020, I decided to make a list of 10 goals that I wanted to accomplish for the next 10 years. And the reason I did that is because it was a supposed to be a New Year's resolution. You know how you make a list of things or set some goals for yourself. Uh, for that specific year, I decided that I wanted to do uh, 10 big things for the next 10 years and ideally do one thing every year. And I wrote some personal things down. Well, I mean, they were all personal, but some are, you know, only I get to know. <laughs> but there were some uh, goals that I had put on that list that, um, that uh, were very important to me that I try and get done. One of them was to write and publish a book. Because I've always wanted to do that. And I'm not entirely sure. I didn't really care what the book was about. Whether it be fiction or non-fiction. I do like to write some fiction from time to time. But I mean that's kind of hard to get published. Plus I've always been a pretty steadfast non-fiction consumer. Well the one thing that I probably have the best luck of trying to get published. Is to write some sort of textbook. Or maybe not even a textbook, but more like a, I don't know what you'd call it, a study guide. That's the thing. I'm trying to figure out, like, if I'm going to write a book, then there should be a good reason as to why I'm writing it and who the intended audience is. And the my idea for this book came for going through the master's program. Because if you remember from a long time ago, I mentioned in a video that I did not study mathematics as an undergrad. I studied environmental science. Although I had a strong math background before I switched over to EES. But when I finished my degree, I really wanted to go back and get a master's degree in math. So I switched from, you know, environmental science to math. But the classes that I took as a master's student were pretty tough for me. Because it was a different type of math mathematics than what I'm used to. Um, you know, all of college algebra and calculus, elementary linear algebra, all those courses are pretty computational heavy, at least in the United States they are. I can't really speak about what it's like in other countries. I think even in like Calc 3 and maybe like... I want to say Russia. The reason I say Russia is because I know some Russian instructors... Um, that when they went through, you know, when they started studying math, they were doing, I think, proofs a lot earlier than we were. But until you take math proofs and then you take the courses that come after it, like modern algebra and real variables, number theory, if you want to throw that in there, it, it be, the math changes at that point. And then if you were really good at math before that, like me, then you are no longer good at math after that because <laughs> it's not computation anymore. It's very philosophical, like how do you go about proving stuff. So the idea for the book came from me wanting to have some sort of survival guide, if you will, of how to think about analysis, how to do even the simple problems. Like how do you go about thinking about them? Because I would spend like hours on easy problems. I look back and they're easy now because I'm, you know five years older and been doing math a lot longer. Well, five years. You can do a lot of math in five years is what I'm saying. They're, they're easy for me now, but back then they were, I struggled a lot. So I was thinking like there should be some sort of guide to help grad students like myself. So that's really the whole inspiration behind the book. I don't know. There's probably something out there that's like that. But again, remember, this is supposed to be like 10, 10 goals for... That would be a big accomplishment for myself. And I encourage you guys to do the same if you're, you know, a steadfast watcher of this channel, <laughs> viewer of this channel. Is that it's good to have big goals that you want to accomplish over the next 5 to 10 years. And I have a, uh, accomplished some of those goals that were on that list. I think I put on there to make some sort of short film which I ended up doing. It took me a couple months to make it. I made it in 2021. And technically, I, I am already published. I wrote a paper with my thesis advisor, and it was published about... It was also published in 2021, but it was cited 
in 2022, which I was pretty excited about that because that means somebody actually read my work and thought it was important. <laughs> so small goals, well, well sm small victories, I should say. It was a pretty big deal for me. Anyway, so what am I showing you here? These are essentially my my book in um, in the making. Um, this folder of it says complex analysis has about 200 pages worth of notes in it, and the real analysis is about the same. It's about 200 pages. Um, I think it's kind of amazing that I was able to fit two semesters worth of material in here and one semester's worth of material here, and yet they're about the same size. So I'm not really sure what happened there. It's really a semester and a little bit more for complex. It's really just the last chapter. So I thought in this video, I would show you some stuff in the folder. Uh, the first chapter here, it is ba broken up in chapters. You can see I have a ton of examples of um, metric spaces. So the first chapter is about metric spaces. And I introduce some uh, inequalities in here like Cauchy-Schwartz, Holder's inequality, the Minkowski inequality. Um, I should mention that I say I wrote this book, and yes, I know it's written in pencil and paper because, like a pleb, I didn't actually type it up. And it really, this is supposed to be more like um, a rough, 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 rough first draft <laughs> of my book. And I've it, at the moment, this is just notes. But when I actually do end up typing it in LaTeX and making sure that everything is nice and pretty and the, the font is the way I want it and I have all the nice examples. And I have noticed that I've made typos here. Not too many, which I'm surprised about, but there are a number of typos that need to be fixed before I type it up. Um, forgot where I was going with that statement. But at the moment, it really is just supposed to be a collection of examples and proofs. There are proofs in here. It's not just completely just, well, here's the statement of the theorem. And I think I just say, nope, I wrote the whole thing. So I wrote up the proof here. Um, the references that I used for writing these notes is I essentially, play, <laughs> yeah, I played, I basically plagiarized. It is kind of a good question of like how much, how much, um, can you look at the source material to write a math book? Because, I mean, essentially, like, a lot of these proofs are all written the same, right? And you can have liberties with notation. The que I guess the big question is, is, like, what flow makes sense to you? Like, what order should you put stuff in? But a lot of analysis books, I think, more or less follow the same type of flow. Like... For example, this first chapter I essentially copied out of the Kolmogorov book because I like the way Kolmogorov presents the material. There's the completion theorem and how long it is. So this is all the completion theorem plus everything on this page and this page and most of this page. It takes so long to prove the completion theorem. I don't like it. All that to say that every metric space has a completion unique up to isometry. And then we have fixed point theorem, which is one of my favorite theorems. And the reason it's one of my favorites is because the proof is uh, really easy to understand and learn. It uses a geometric series in it, which I like. So I basically used most of Kolmogorov to write chapter one. And then chapter two is topology. So immediately in his book, he has a, he has a um, chapter on topological spaces. And I more or less copy what he does. I don't want to copy exactly everything. Because, I mean, what's the point? Then it's just notes at that point. But it's a it's an art form to make something your own. And the idea of this study guide is to, like, if you have a proof, for example. Uh, what's this one say? XD is compact if and only if X is totally bounded and complete. The idea is to take something like this, this big chunk of notes here, and write it in a way that is really attractive to the eye. So 
Like maybe just have one line that says X compact implies X complete. And I wrote obvious. Dangerous word to say. And then like each sentence will maybe get a line and I want to make sure that it's not too cluttered is what I'm going for so that when you're reading it as a student, you can immediately say like, okay, I can identify immediately from looking at it what the trick is. I don't really think I accomplished that in a lot of this book, but I do think, at least for me, reading this is not a headache. And a Borel theorem. Uh, so that was chapter two. I haven't included questions in here, but I'm thinking about going back and putting in questions in this um, quote-unquote book of mine. Okay, so chapter three is about the Lebesgue measure. It's just Lebesgue measure and Lebesgue measure construction. Uh, for this chapter, I mostly took inspiration from the Zygmunt Whedon book and the Stein Shikarchi book. Because there's things about... I think Stein Shikarchi is written better than Whedon, but I like the way Whedon does certain things. And I wanted to use their definitions and theorems over Stein Shikarchi's because I, I think the way he goes through the material makes more sense to me. But that Whedon book is one of the reasons why I was inspired to try and write my own book in the next couple of years is because his book, for me, if I open it up and look at it, it's hard for me to identify um, important things. It's not like a quick reference book. Kolmogorov, I think, did a better job of it because I was able to find information faster in that book when we were using it. But uh, for the Whedon book, uh, it's a different story. So chapter one is all about Lebesgue measure. Chapter four is about Lebesgue measurable functions. So the next couple of chapters here aren't about generic measures or just any old measures. It's specific to Lebesgue measure. Let's see here. So basically these theorems are saying you can play around with measurable functions. Blah, 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 blah. Characteristic function. Simple functions, which play into the next chapter. Big Bad Igorov's Theorem, Borel Cantelli Lemma, my favorite. Lucian's Theorem, which I've yet to memorize. This theorem, I'm pretty good at now. There's my quote unquote typewriter sequence. I call it that. I don't think anyone else calls it that. It's just I call it that because it helps me remember what exactly goes on here. And then you have this theorem which says that if you have convergence and measure on a set, then there exists a subsequence that converges pointwise. Maybe E has to be a finite measure in order for it to make sense, in which case I wrote down the theorem wrong. <laughs> or at least I need to add more to it. But I'll do that when I'm sitting down and writing it in LaTeX. And then when it's done, I'll give it to someone else to read, and they can point out all my little mistakes. Chapter 5, we do the Lebesgue integral. So again, this is all with respect to Lebesgue measure. Although the Lebesgue integral, you know, is defined similarly for other measures. Bounded convergence theorem. I think in this part, I was looking a lot at stein shikarchi But Zygmunt and Whedon were... <clears throat> I also used a lot. Fatou's lemma. Monotone convergence theorem. Blah, 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 blah. This I know I copied straight out of stein shikarchi I remember that example. Uh, let's see here. Absolute continuity, Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. There's another proof of the dominated convergence theorem that I prefer than the one I wrote here. And I'm not really sure why I wrote this one. I probably copied out of stein shikarchi Chebyshev's inequality which is one of my dad's favorite names from these. And I, sometimes I tell my parents about uh, the stuff I study, even though I know it's a little bit above them. But they like the names. Like, my dad likes Chebyshev. He also likes Koshy Schwartz. Fubini's Theorem, which I hate because it's long. It's divided into six steps, I think. So this is all Fubini's, Fubini's Theorem. Yeah, six steps. 
comes with an example, Tonelli's theorem. All right, we need to speed this up. So Tonelli's theorem, and then there's some other corollaries and theorems about it. This is pretty much all from Stein Shikarchi. But this last page here is about uniform integrability. And I noticed that there really wasn't a section in that book that talked specifically about it. And these theorems, uh, this theorem I got from the internet, but the reason I included it is because I needed something about uniform integrability that wasn't there. And, I mean, this stuff might be, like, in the back of a book, like, as an exercise, but it kind of stopped with Fubini's and then went to the next chapter. But I needed something about it, and I needed this theorem because I knew that my instructor that covers analysis, he covers this theorem. He doesn't call it this by this name, by the way. I just remember the statement. And then I found on Wikipedia the actual name of it. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It's too French for me. But uh, I needed to include it. So I, it's there and I didn't have enough room. I had already started writing this. So that's why I wrote down here, space is limited, so no proofs. And I wrote a sad face. So I definitely have to go back and beef this up, make it more readable. Chapter 6 is about differentiation, so it has all the covering lemmas, it has the hardy littlewood maximal function. This chapter has some of my favorite proofs in it, but for the most part, I don't like this chapter. It's my least favorite in the book. How sad that is. All the covering lemmas are important. All four of them, the infinite and finite versions of Vitaly and Besikovich. Because we covered it in class. I tried to mimic what my instructor... I tried throwing in stuff that my instructor had put in because my goal was to use this to also study for my qualifying exam. Variation, blah, 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 blah. This is the stuff I don't care. This lemma has a cute name. It's called the Rising Sun Lemma, which comes from this picture. This, I'm positive, came out of Stein Shikarchi. I didn't use uh, Zygmunt and Whedon for this. Cantor LeBeg's function, absolute continuity again. How, how long is this chapter? Jump functions, points of discontinuity, points of non differentiability. Okay, so that was chapter six. Kind of sp sped through it because I don't care about it. <laughs> I should care, but. It's the, my least favorite chapter. And then everything past here was pretty much with respect to Lebesgue measure. I just I didn't really talk about anything other than Lebesgue measure. And then chapter 7 is where we abstract all the things we learn and start talking about different types of measures. So here's the general definition of an outer measure. We have Carathéodory measurable sets, well-separating sets. And we have a theorem. If you have an outer measure on a set and you have M as a sigma, then M is a sigma algebra where M is defined as the set of all well-separating sets. Then if you restrict your outer measure to M, you will get a measure. And I make a comment about what a measure is here because <laughs> it feels weird. Really, this should be up here and then the theorem because I'm defining measure after I've already used it, which isn't good. Okay, and then there's a proof that goes along with it. Here I give some different examples of measures, open and close sets, Borel measurable sets, regularity makes an appearance because I haven't talked about it at all throughout the book. If mu is a Borel, me uh, Borel measure and it's finite for any balls of finite radius, then mu has to be regular. Here we have an algebra. Here we've defined a pre-measure which is basically a measure in the making. And then this lemma shows how we can extend an outer measure to a pre-measure. Or no, sorry. Um, how to get a pre-measure. Sorry, I keep screwing that up. How to get an outer measure from a pre-measure. And then the theorem after that shows that we can take that outer measure from the pre-measure and make a measure from it. So much measure. Okay, and now this next chapter is really all dedicated to um, the Hausdorff construction of measure. 
So like Hausdorff measures. I haven't memorized any of this. It's I copied this out of the Whedon book. And I think it made sense to me at the time, but I haven't really looked over it that closely. I hope there's no Hausdorff stuff on the qualifying exam. Typically there's not, which means that we're due. Abstract integration. So here I go through all of integrals again, except now we're talking about it with respect to any measure that you want. There isn't too much different. I use the stein Shikarchi book mostly for this to uh, basically say, okay, so we have integrals, but you can integrate with respect to different measures, but the construction is more or less the same as what we used to use in Chapter 5. Interesting things. There's Big Bad Fubini. And I always think it's kind of funny that this Fubini theorem is only this long. Because I just say, eh, just use some old theorems. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I don't want to write it. Completion of measure spaces. Measure spaces may not be complete. Because we might be missing sets of measure zero. Outer measure zero. Yeah, so I wanted... One big, one big thing I wanted to use in this book was to make sure that I had enough examples so that you could picture stuff. Like this, for example, where we talk about sine measures, sigma finite, mutually singular, because this eventually leads into one of the most famous theorems in analysis, or at least to me, one of the most famous theorems is the radon nicodem theorem. And I used uh, the proof that my instructor gave me uh, for radon nicodem because it, I remember him going through it. I remember thinking that it was really easy. But then after class, I remember things like, I don't remember how to prove it. It's like when he did it, it made a ton of sense. But when I read it in books and stuff, I, I get confused easily and it doesn't make any sense to me. So I wrote down his proof. I say his proof, but it's really, I think, von Neumann's proof that you can find on Wikipedia. But uh, for Radon Nicodem, to help remember what the statement says, I always think of this picture, this specific example, because it makes a, a lot of sense to me. It has, it's just an example that has a lot to, um, a lot of visual, what am I trying to say? It's a very useful example to understand the theorem. I'll just say it that way. Okay, so push forward a measure. This is not included in the Stein book, but my instructor talks about push forward a measure a lot, so for these last couple pages, I decided to make some comments about it. And then chapter 9 is very short. It's about LP spaces because I didn't really talk about LP norms and stuff. And eventually it finishes with Young's Inequality, Holders, and Minkowski, which is how this book started. And then I defined what a Hilbert space was. And that's pretty much it. I wrote thank you at the bottom for reading my book. So it's about 207 pages. And there's questions that I started yesterday. So if you're interested in solving some of these old homework and qualifier problems that I've written here, you know, you're more than welcome to. But anyway, this video is kind of long, so I'm not going to show you the other binder, so I'll probably do it in another video. Thank you.